Good afternoon, it's Janine from Janine Cares, where we're caring, achieving, restoring, empowering, and supporting our youth for the future. I am here today with uh, a friend, of, or a soror, and a friend. Um, she was, again, another recommendation of soror, Alita Harris. She has been giving me a lot of referrals. Thank you, Alita Harris, for all of your referrals. This is Maya Harris Cameron, her sister. I'm honored to have her here today to share another legacy leadership story. So Maya, thank you for being with me today, So War um, of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Um, just share a little bit about your background experiences that have placed you where you are today. So um, I was a foreign service officer with the US Department of State uh, for nine years until I moved to another uh, government agency. Um, so I had a career in international relations. I, uh, I've actually been to numerous countries, <laughs> um, Russia, Poland, Germany, Belarus, the Netherlands, uh, Mexico, Panama, I could go on and on, Namibia, Swaziland, um, Nigeria. Wow. Uh, all of the I could, I could continue to name, uh, countries that I've served, but I primarily worked on, on uh, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. I did a consular tour in uh, Montreal, Canada. I worked at the Maine State Department. Um, and then I switched to another government agency uh, where I first focused on Africa inter and African energy production before I uh, left the field of international relations and I started working in congressional affairs. Since I started working in Congressional Affairs, I have uh, served as the primary liaison for uh, my government agency with um, various committees on the Hill, both authorization committees and appropriations committees. And it's my job to manage the relationship between the agency and um, the Hill uh, so that they understand what my agency does uh, and additionally, so we can secure uh, the budget as recommended by the president's budget request uh, on the yearly uh, legislative cycle. So that's what I do. Um, that's what I do. And uh, I, I have spoken uh, to youth groups, uh, especially through Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated about my work. Uh, I would say my work is comparable to being a congressional staffer and uh, I would love to run for office one day. Uh, and I think that is like the progression. Of all right. That's interesting. Very kudos to you for all the work that you're doing, the leadership, the experience is amazing. I have not traveled anywhere near as much as you. Um, Tell me, you know, about your background growing up that caused you to get into such a field. It seemed like a very exciting opportunity. Well, I tell you what, it's, 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 it's something that was completely faded. It must have been because it all starts uh, for, it's a very um, unique to the African-American experience that one thing just led to another. It all started with a bad perm, if you can believe it. So, a bad perm? Is that what you said? Perm, a bad relaxer, yes. Uh, so when I was um, 13 years old, I, uh, I got a perm, and, um, the re and what happened was the hairdresser had heard that Sprite, if you pour Sprite on somebody's hair while they're going to perm, it makes it straighter. And so it did. It really did. It made my hair, like, stick straight. That's my favorite then, drink, but I'm not um, going to try that. <laughs> Don't do it because it came out. It came out like all over my head. And so, but my sister, my oldest sister, who is also a Delta, thank you very much. She was in law school at the <laughs> University of Baltimore at the time. And she was like, it was like a practice case study. She like took pictures. And then we, you know, my parents and she, you know, talked to the salon and said that they wanted compensation. So for a year, I got my hair done for free. And um, they actually nice can't beat that. <laughs> and I was a cheerleader. I mean, she was talking about the emotional impacts of this cheerleader having. That's you know. what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. So, 
So what ended up happening was the salon ended up, my mom at the same time was uh, a teacher and she had heard about um, People to People International Student Ambassadors Program. And so, um, and one of her fellow teachers was gonna be a chaperone. And so the salon ended up sponsoring me. You had to have like a corporate sponsor. So the salon ended up sponsoring me and paying like a lot of my fees. And then I went overseas and, um, you know, I spent uh, almost three months overseas when I was 14 years old and I did several home stays and that got me interested in, the, in international affairs. And um, in college, I went to Howard University, like, you're, like you, uh-oh, H-U. And so- oh, I, gotta, uh, I, gotta, I was, gotta go back, H-U, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Howard University and uh, I majored I ended up majoring in anthropology, anthropology being uh, the study of, of human existence over time and uh, human cultural. So you have, um, you have uh, cultural, uh, physical or biological archeology, span uh, but really I was into cultural anthropology, uh, which is the study of you know, different cultures, um, different histories of uh, different peoples all over the globe. And so uh, while in college, I took the foreign service exam and I ended up passing the first time. Uh, it was very threatening, like, because I was, I remember when I had my oral exam, uh, there, Georgetown at the time had a school of foreign service work and all, they call them the Georgetown Mafia actually, uh, because they always get in. But in the end, all those people from Georgetown, they didn't pass the exam, I did. And, uh, it was really excellent. So I've, you know, I've met with Secretary of, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, uh, former, uh, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. I've worked, you know, I've supported them in meetings. And uh, I could tell you so much about, um, about how much Secretary Powell specifically meant to me. Uh, when I was in the Foreign Service, I was stationed in Algiers, Algeria. In North and in, uh, in uh, North Africa, it's actually in a region called the Maghreb. And um, bef when I was taking the Foreign Service exam, he actually was on the board at Howard University. And so I met him then, and then I met him again when you know my class. I met him again uh, when they took a picture of my A100 class. That's the they, they call that the orientation class when you just pass the um, foreign service exam before they send you out into the field. And so then when I was in Algiers, I was living and working at the embassy, uh, he was coming, he was coming. All of a sudden he was coming and I led a team to prepare for his press conference. And uh, you know, I spent weeks at the Algiers Hilton, you know, and I knew everybody on the site, my team of uh, foreign service nationals, they had everything on life. I had a, because I was a, my minor was communications. I had a script, my whole team. They knew what to do. They knew where to go. Every step was choreographed. And then I got a call 10 minutes before Secretary Powell was supposed to wrap. And the call was from his advance officer saying, Maya, the Algerian foreign minister wants to be at the press conference and speak at the press conference with Secretary Powell. Now, this doesn't seem like a big deal maybe, but they had one podium. They had, so I had to get the set changed within 10 minutes to have two people, all the microphones set up and the um, you know, state seal for Algeria and uh, the United States so that they could both you know, present equally and be uh, seen as equals in front of, you know, this press conference, all the media. But because I had made those on the ground connections, I knew exactly who to call. Uh, at the time, my French was top notch <laughs> and uh, I was able to pull it off within 10 minutes. And so I remember after the press conference was over, we were all uh, on the tarmac just waiting for Secretary Powell and the Algerian uh, foreign minister, the Algerian president, the ambassador at the time, to walk past us. We were all in our trench coats and our suits and walk past us and get on the plane and fly away. And I, had, I was just like, 
oh my gosh, how did I get here? I was, uh, how old was I? I was 23. And so Secretary Powell walks by, he's talking to the pre Algerian president, the foreign minister, the ambassador. He gets past me, he stops. He takes a few steps back and then he starts shaking my hand. He comes up to me and shakes my hand. And he says to me, he says, you're one of our junior officers, aren't you? I said, oh, yes, sir, I am. I'm shaking his hand. Yes, sir, I am. And he says, I met you when you were at Howard University, didn't I? Ah! <laughs> I almost died. I said, ain't you, ain't you unforgettable, right? Yes. Yeah, we, I told, I had been telling my staff, I was like, he doesn't know me. He's going to remember me. And I said, yes, sir, he did. And he winked at me and he said, good job. And then he just kept talking with the foreign minister, the president. He got up on that plane and it just took off. And we were all waving there, everybody from the embassy. It, it was one of the greatest moments of my life. Oh, that's nice. For your service. I mean, all this you've done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Secretary of State Colin Powell, he knows how to, he knew how to acknowledge the work of, you know, anybody from a janitor all the way up to a president or a minister or secretary and that is what restorative practices is all about and so my name is janine beck janine stewart beck um, where we are in a janine cares is caring achieving restoring empowering and supporting our youth for the future i'm live today from bus boys and poets here in washington dc i'm here um, visiting my, my son who's in DC with his father and so it's an exciting time to be in this area. Um, the energy, the Black Lives Matter is just all over all the businesses. Um, it's just amazing to see the city um, of Washington and, and all that's going on here. All the windows are painted with different things. Um, say their name, Black Lives Matter. It's just the energy is great. And so I'm here at one of the black owned restaurants, Bus Boys and Poets, um, just here, and thinking I need to get a meal, and then I'm gonna meet up with my daughter and have some more fun with her. So it's an amazing energy, amazing time. Thank you for sharing an amazing journey. You are so blessed and fortunate to have had so many opportunities, starting even at a young age. Um, Thank you. And, and all those experiences and travel and just getting to know some you know powerful leaders. Yeah, what a what an experience. So now. Um, you can, you bring a very unique perspective and like having a lot of experiences. Can you tell me, since March 13th, when quarantine started, you heard about coronavirus and COVID, because they're, they're different, you know, like HIV and AIDS, coronavirus and then COVID-19. Um, what have you been thinking about from since March 13th until now? What are some of the things that have been on your mind? When we think about restorative practices, I think two things. I think relationships and I think reflection. So reflect for a moment. What have you been thinking about since March 13th? I have been thinking about protecting my children. Uh, I have a five-year-old son and a two-year-old son, almost two, he'll be two on July 27th. And that has really been consuming me. And, you know, I've told you a little bit about my work. I have been expected to keep up the same pace of my work uh, since this, uh, since the shutdowns began in March. And it's so funny that, you know, the funny thing is, and I've said this to uh, people who know me, is that uh, March 13th was uh, Friday the 13th. And so it, Friday it certainly was. was the last normal day. <laughs> it was the last normal day <laughs> of, uh, you know, last normal day of my life before, uh, before my life changed where everybody's lives changed. And um, since then, I mean, you know, schools have been out, daycares uh, have been out. So my primary concern was, you know, how can I care for my children and, you know, continue the pace of work, continue to meet the expectations that uh, my agency and quite frankly, the nation have had of me. And so uh, without my parents, uh, without, um, without the elders in my life, I would not have been able to maintain that pace. So I definitely, I definitely can relate to you on that. I definitely, you know, that, that whole work-life balance, um, you, you know, it's important that we, we, we focus on the mental health, right? And so in order to do that, we have to maintain our peace 
and we have to, you know, experience the stress, but also kind of manage it. And there's so many things that give so many people stress during this time that, um, you know, it's really important that we focus. So what is the hardest thing? What has been the hardest thing since March 13th for you as a woman, as a uh, mother? What's been the hardest thing? Uh, I mean, uh, again, I would just say it's it's really maintaining the work pace. Uh, I feel, you know, Saturday Night Live, the daily social distancing show, all the shows on TV, I think that they have, um, you know, I'm fortunate to still have a job. Let me say that first. I am so fortunate. So Absolutely. Many people, yes. right now, the economy yeah. is um, you know, I'm I'm one of those people that can work from home and get the job done, especially once we uh, move to a, a new normal of having um, conference calls and, and video calls for meetings um, instead of in-person meetings. So that that really helped. Uh, but I, I feel like um, the on television and in uh, social media, they've talked about how there was all this extra time. All this extra time to try something new. I haven't had any extra time. <laughs> I haven't had any I extra can relate. time. <laughs> no. where, where, where is that time again? It seems like your calendar is even busier. Because everybody wants yeah. to go to the Zoom meeting. You're like, okay, not another Zoom meeting. Right. It's like it's like things have been. Uh, I think it's and it's also because and this is just a general um, issue that the nation has got to overcome this. The, our culture has got to overcome this idea that when you are teleworking, you are on and on call 24 seven. Because that's how, that's how I think it's kind of been treated. Uh, you, you work, uh, I mean, you really do put in a lot of work and a, a lot more time because you yourself want to feel productive. And yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. It's been, a, it's been a balance. Like, you know, and even like, even if you manage your own calendar, you still tend to put maybe too much on it, you know, exactly. so, instead of having those little breaks that you would normally get when you schedule a meeting. Because if you were going across town to a meeting, you have a little bit of a reprieve in between, right? Right. So you do have to be mindful of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, exa I mean, I remember days when I had um, briefings with eight different congressional, six to eight different congressional offices, and uh, I had the conference call lined up for one office, and then I had a, a phone, another phone, and I was calling into the other, and my boss was on one line, and then he, when he saw that I had already set up the call and I was on the other phone, he was like, how did you do that? I mean, he admitted that he was impressed. <laughs> right, and we are resourceful for nothing else, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, there you go, there you go. It's like you get that tip to so like, okay, I have a meeting, but then I also want to be at this community event. Maybe I can put them on this computer and see the one time. It's a little bit on us too, a little bit, right? It is, it is. It's, and I think that that is, um, I think that that is something that women right now, mothers also have to address. A lot of the things that, you know, we're putting a lot of it on ourselves because we, think that we're going to be perceived a certain way. I mean, a lot of it is true. Like, you know, your mother, uh, are men working? You know, I read an article, I believe it was in the Washington Post, and it discussed how actually, it might have been in the Lily, actually, which is associated with the Washington Post. Uh, but it was about how women have a more difficult time networking uh, during this COVID area when everybody is teleconferencing because um, they don't, we don't feel comfortable if you just met somebody virtually to call them up for a favor, whereas men do. So a woman will go to a professional uh, conference, according to the article, and then try to meet up somebody after work, try to have a drink with them, try to, you know, um, find some common ground, and then make that call later to cash in a favor. Well, during this era, we haven't been able to do that. And so you have to, you have to take that inner, um, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's a masculine energy, but kind of embrace something that men do. And I can ask you for a favor because my position merits it. My professionalism merits it. And damn it, you want to give me this information because I can help you out. No, that's right. I'm the one. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, my tag name on Instagram used to be Jen Too Nice, but I tell you, you know, I, I've, I've arrived a little bit more, and I've, I've known that I have to really, you know, hold boundaries for all aspects of my life and give myself a piece mm -hmm. of, of, of grace in everything, in work and in personal and community, and so it, it kind of connects to what you're saying. That's that's great. So, how are you remaining positive? You have a lot going on. What are you doing for like wellness or positive? So for wellness, that's a great question. At first I was, uh, my mother, you know, I, I mentioned my mother and how she's and my parents and how they really helped me with the children. I, my mother really inspired me, uh, to say, you need to take some time for yourself. You need to find a way to carve that out. So, um, self care. Yes. Very yeah, important. -care. And so a lot of that means kind of embracing, uh, finding parts of yourself that, you may have lost. And so one of the things that I used to love when I was in high school, I was on the um, Palm Squad and I was a cheerleader. Uh, and uh, so I've been finding dance workouts, you know, um, to do in the morning before the kids get up. And so I've really kind of embraced that. And it, you know, it feels good. It reminds me of the feeling that I used Where to are these dance workouts? Like what sites? Shout out the site where you're finding these. On Amazon Prime, girl. Like, yes. uh, I love, yes, I love Dance Fit with Mon Monica. And they break it down, okay? I like Dance Fit with Monica. I like, actually, there's a Latin Zoom course with uh, uh, Jenny Ford on Amazon Prime that I like. I like, um, uh, oh. So Amazon Prime is like a Netflix kind of thing? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Amazon wow. Prime. Oh, let me hip you. <laughs> so I get. Uh, yes, hit me, sis, please. <laughs> So I, I've been doing, um, oh, and there's the Banks Method with, um, yeah, with this uh, fitness instructor named Banks. She has this arm workout that's like 10 minutes, and it is killer. Uh, Dance Fit with Monica, the Banks Method. I've been doing um, standing abs, four-minute standing abs. I've been doing, you know, all this that stuff. That sounds in intense. Standing abs? <laughs> yes. So I've been trying to, like I said, get back in touch with some of those aspects of myself that may have, I may have lost along the way because I was just focusing on the career or just focusing on the kids. All right. Well, I'm glad that your mother and your family are in your life to be support systems because that's really important as a mom, as a, you know, as a woman. Um, and so what about you as a parent or you as a mom? Could you share like, words of wisdom, things that you've overcome, words of advice for parents? You know, maybe another person as a mom or going through like the kind of things you're going through, or for your students, how do you encourage your children? Because it's like a lot of uncertainty, right? Okay. A lot of uncertainty. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> this is what I would say. And I would say, um, okay, I'm a big, big supporter of Disney Plus. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> no, no, but I'm a big supporter of Disney Plus. And if you're out there and you're a mom and you're struggling, I'm not, uh, you know, my kids, uh, I'm a big supporter of abcmouse.com and the learning applications. But the reason I reference Disney Plus is that it kind of um, uh, got me back to one of the things is that some of the movies that I used to love as a kid and and looking at the themes in them um you know has really made a difference and even some of the new movies like for example you asked me how did you know how have I been moving forward in COVID what's kept you going in Frozen 2 one of the characters uh who uh, you know the the sister Anna who doesn't have powers She's figuring out, you know, how can I help? How can I be of help in this situation that I have no control over? When, you know, I have no control over the world around me, what can I do? And she tells herself, all I can do is do the next right thing. And that means a lot to me. And that has, that I love it. I love it. Character, it's character over everything, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, and I, that's actually a lesson that I've learned since, uh, you know, since Disney Plus rolled out and I, 
and it's true. It's true. The only thing you can do, the only thing any of us can do is to do the next right thing. I love that. I love that. And that applies to both parents and students and everyone. So Maya, thank you for being with me today on Janine Cares. Once again, it's Janine from Janine Cares, where we're caring, achieving, restoring, and empowering our youth for the future. Speaking of our youth, we have a girls' conference coming up on my birthday, August the 6th. Maya, if you're interested in being on the panel for that, the conference is going to be from 6 to 9 p.m. on August the 6th. I'm hoping to broadcast live from some Black-owned business in Frederick and, and, and virtually like just meet with these 64 young women. I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sparty Incorporated, as you and your sisters are. Um, and we are... Um, from Howard, Alpha Chapter, Spring 1996, we had 64 women, the venturous women of Voracious 64. So we will be honoring that 25th year anniversary that's coming up next year at Howard Homecoming. Unfortunately, we're not having Homecoming this year, but next year we will have Howard Homecoming. And I'm um, honoring um, our legacy of venturous, venturous women of Voracious 64 through a girls' conference. Well, so I'm going to do on my birthday community service. And so we need a couple more speakers to be able to just pour on a night of elegance, excellence, and empowerment. So just, you know, you sound like you could fit right in with excellence. <laughs> so if you want to be a speaker, oh, let I, me know. I yeah, I would love to. I can totally do it. I'll be there Thank for you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I would say, Janine, you are doing something that is amazing and sorely needed. Hearing other people's stories about how they're persevering, how they got to where they are in spite of uh, you know, racism, in, fight, in spite of sexism, all of these stories, you know, you're, you're putting together a body of work that cannot be ignored. And I salute you for that. Oh, thank you. I'm really trying. I'm really trying. Um, it's funny because the, the name Janine Pierce can, can be deemed a little bit self-serving because you're using the word Janine, your own name, but it's really about the cares part, caring, achieving, restoring, empowering, supporting, and inspiring our youth to be lead. I'm so, to be leaders and to lead. Learn, empower, act with an action plan, being strategic, and dreaming big. You know, you had to have a dream in order to get where you were and to be able to explore the world like that. And somebody believed in you. They empowered you. And they empowered you because you have an action plan. You know, you don't just go in and sit down at the table. You go in and you think about what you're going to do before you even sit at that seat to take, right? right? And then you are a leader naturally. I mean, you're a Howard University grad. So, I mean, <laughs> there you go. That's enough said. But, you know. Naturally, as a woman, it's you know we we're, we're built to be leaders, and so thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Alita. Alita's in the back of somewhere. Where's Alita? <laughs> Alita, thank you for your time. Yes, yes, she can't resist coming. Yes, she got hey, Alita. My beautiful. <laughs> thank you so much for all your recommendations, Alita. You've given me so many recommendations. It's been amazing. Um, she's my fan. Spring '96, yay! That's right. Yes. <laughs> you look great to me. You look great. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate you, Sword Wars, my sisters. Um, have a wonderful evening, and I might see you soon. So, as we sign off today, thank you for supporting Janine Cares, where we're caring, achieving, restoring, empowering, and supporting. Signing out for the Delta in the house. Yeah, that house over here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, ladies. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone, and be blessed and highly favored.